at this point of the day, we've reached uh, the keynote, uh, which is going to be given by Professor Michael Hart. Uh, Professor Michael Hart is a political philosopher and literally theorist currently based at Duke University in North Carolina. Professor Hart's recent writings focus primarily on deciphering various aspects of globalization. His most famous work, Empire of 2000 and Multitude, uh, War and Democracy in the Age of Empire, 2004, were written in collaboration with Antonio Negri and according to Zom, became major events in political and critical theory. In 2009, uh, these two works will be accompanied, well, they were accompanied by the next part of the trilogy entitled Commonwealth. Uh, in 2012, Hart and Tony Negri published Declaration, uh, a pamphlet addressed to encampments and occupations that began in 2011. And I guess there's no further presentation to do other than thank Professor Hart on behalf of the entire organization committee and on behalf of everyone who is here as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Maria. I want to thank the organizers, Edward and Camila, Sarah, the other organizers, uh, for putting on this conference. You know, it's going to get, I still have my sweater, you guys are going to get hot. Um, but I don't know, there are no windows open, so I think we'll, I'll talk fast. The thing, what, what, I, what I want to present is about, uh, let's say, the problem of leadership that I've been thinking about for some time. And I want to start with a story that's of course familiar to many of you about the errors of the Commonwealth. Uh, April 1871, Marx from London uh, is writing to his friend Kugelmann about the about the, the commune arts in Paris, both admiring uh, the Parisians, their establishment of the commune, their construction of a new form of democracy, uh, their storming the heavens, their smashing the state admiring all these things, but he posed two errors that the commune arts made. Uh, the first error, he points out, that the commune arts made was a military error. Uh, they failed to march on the bourgeois troops that had retreated to Versailles. Um, and that is, uh, and he says that they were, they were too good, they were too angelic. The commune arts were too angelic. They didn't want to start a civil war. And in fact, that's not what I, I, I'd be happy to, and I'd be interested in trying to ask if that question about the military error, the need for political violence is, is a problem still with us. But I'm going to leave that one aside. The second error that Marx is talking about, which I do want to pursue, is the political error of the communists. Their political error was, again, for being too good, for being too angelic, was that the, is that the commune arts uh, disbanded their central committee too quickly. They surrendered the power of the central committee too soon. That's what I'm, and so, and so Marx then uh, concludes already before the, before the defeat of the commune, he says, if they are to be defeated, it'll be because they were too good, because they were too good in these two regards, that they, of these two errors, the, the, the military error and the political error. It seems to me that this dynamic or mentality uh, has defined the subsequent century of revolutionary organizing. This mentality of the heirs of the communists. Uh, on the one side, a virtuous but naive democratic experiment, and on the other side, a necessary and perhaps effective centralized control. Uh, horizontal democratic experiments versus vertical uh, forms of leadership with both alternatives more or less impossible. That's what, so, so I guess that's my opening question. Maybe the only question I'm gonna to try to answer is that um, whether the framework of these errors of the commune arts still define revolutionary organizing in our era. That's what, this framework of, and I'll, I think I'll be able to explain in a few minutes what I mean by that. 
Um, what I want eventually to address, and maybe this you can already take uh, for granted, is that I've been trying to think the problem of leadership in the context of the so-called leaderless movements of recent years, partly in the cycle of struggles from 2011 to 2013, um, and many others that, that, that in some ways are, are lateral to that. Um, and what it has seemed to me, that maybe this is just a, a starting point that, that doesn't get us very far, uh, is that we're faced with a false alternative. Uh, or at least what, an alternative that seems false to me. Uh, in one sense, the movements seem to be told today, well, on the one hand, those will say that the horizontal formations are all fine, that we are winning, uh, that the prefigurative experiences are, are, are revolution itself. And on the other side is a uh, <coughs> posing the need to return to traditional centralized uh, leadership structures. Seems to me both of these alternatives are not adequate. And so then my question, of course, is well, then what do you need to do? And that's 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 really where I want to go. But first, I want to start with at least explaining in, in a, a very brief outline and very reductive, I suppose, way the ways in which I see that mentality of the heirs of the commune are shaping a century of revolutionary struggle forms of revolutionary organization, you put it that way. It seems to me that a dominant line of modern revolutionary organizing responds to the problem posed by the errors of the commune arts with a dialectic, or sometimes maybe you could just say a, a, a combination between leadership and democracy. Democracy is, of course, the goal, eventually, of all these theorists, but, they're, but, but posing revolutionary organization and even a revolutionary notion of leadership as a kind of uh, merging, yeah, a kind of a kind of merging or, or dovetailing, let's say, between democratic organization and leadership. The 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 maybe clearest, maybe reductive, but I find it attractive formulation um, is probably posed by Trotsky. <laughs> Who, and now I'm thinking this is a, a passage on insurrection, a chapter on insurrection in the long history of the Ru Russian Revolution book, where he gives a formula more or less that revolutionary action equals spontaneous insurrection plus conspiracy. Like you need the two to go together. On the one hand, it's the spontaneous insurrection of the masses, but that's on itself is not sufficient. And on the other hand, you need conspiracy, which is a certain, a very, a, maybe an extreme form of opposing leadership. Um, I think it's not dissimilar, at least for the purposes I'm doing here, uh, uh, a concept that Gramsci poses about democratic centralism. Uh, what Gramsci says, dem characterizes democratic centralism, is a bringing together of the thrusts from below and the command from above. In other words, uh, central leadership and democratic initiatives are not in contradiction but actually fit together as two halves. And, and the, the term that Gramsci uses in this passage is like they fit together, it's sort of an industrial notion, like uh, like two gears. The, the, these, uh, yeah, democratic centralism is, is the meshing together, that's the right term, of, of centralized leadership and, and democratic initiative. So the central element in this that I wanted to emphasize and that, that at least pushes me forward is that in this um, tradition, <coughs> a 20th century, let's call it, dominant tradition of, of revolutionary organizing um, is posed a division in, in properly military language between strategy and tactics. Strategy is defined as the province of, of leadership, the province of the party, and what strategy primarily means is the ability to see far. The ability to see far both spatially, in other words, understand the social totality or something like that, the entire social space, and also see far in temporal terms, to be able to uh, guarantee continuity and 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 um, and see, and, and in some ways guarantee the interests of all for the long term. That's the problem <coughs> of strategy, and that requires leadership, according to this tradition, and, and in this tradition primarily the party. On the other hand, is uh, that strategy is divided from tactics, who really has a different population in mind. Um, 
worker revolts and popular struggles are the province of tactics. And tactics are defined as partial and temporary, partial in their social component, uh, part, uh, those struggling for only their own uh, interests, and temporary, short-sighted in that regard. So this seems to me, or this will provide me with a key in a minute, I'll come back to this in a minute, this division between strategy and tactics as a way of linking together the centralized leadership with the uh, democratic initiative. Yep, as in terms of strategy and tactics. But I wanted almost as a parenthesis before coming to the, posing those questions in the contemporary, to at least mention briefly the critiques of leadership and the destructions of revolutionary leadership that um, have occurred by the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I would say that by the 60s and 70s, the forms of revolutionary organization that I was briefly characterizing with those figures from the Third International, uh, Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, Gramsci, that. I think by the 1960s and 70s, that form of revolutionary leadership, the revolutionary organization, is, if not destroyed, at least strongly under attack. So I, on the one hand, and maybe most obviously under external, external attack, uh, with forms of repression against revolutionary leaders, um, there's, of course, all numbers of assassinations and imprisonment. In fact, I would say, from the 1960s and 70s, each country probably has its own pantheon of imprisoned and assassinated revolutionary leaders. Vico uh, and Lumumba, Huey Newton, Rudy Duchka, you can go in each country. I, I think for, for Turkey, Denis Gesmis, or Ibrahim Kapakaya, I'm not sure if the Turkish friends would help. <laughs> like, correct. I mean, I, I think that in, with any country you could go through the, the ways that revolutionary leadership was destroyed, revolutionary leadership destroyed properly through, through forms of repression, and not just the most spectacular forms of repression, of, of assassination and imprisonment, but also um, a series, thousands of smaller but equally effective, or maybe more effective, forms of, rep of repression. Um, various legal actions, criminalizing protests, counter-information campaigns, the kinds of co-optation that make uh, movement leaders into celebrities, use of media, etc. All these things, I think, are, are, are external forms of repression that destroy the conditions for revolutionary leadership as, as we know in the 20th century. Okay, something like that. But I'm much more interested in, and this is why I felt the need to do this parenthesis, in the internal tearing down of these forms of leadership. Um, in other words, revolutionary leaders were not only attacked from, 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 from the forces of order as matters of repression, but by and from the movement themselves. <laughs> Critiques of leadership in the name of democracy. A kind of development of an allergy, like where we've where we've developed antibodies. I think it's a kind of healthy response, a developed immune system to forms of leadership and those who claim to speak in our name, uh, who, who claim to represent us. Um, yeah, so this is refusal to let leaders represent you and to refusal to let leaders develop and to let hierarchies develop within the movements. Maybe the most developed example or the one that seems most interesting to me which one should go into, I think, uh, much further would be about uh, U.S. feminist movements in the late 60s, 19th, early 70s, development of new democratic practices, certainly that, but also um, posing rules against leaders and spokespeople, also uh, forms of punishment against those who uh, speak to the media without permission of the group, those who uh, claim that position. And just as a parenthesis, I find those genealogies of the, of the US versions of Occupy, especially the New York one, much more convincing to trace its roots to the feminist movements of the 60s and 70s than due to the various anarchist traditions. But anyway, that's another, that's another matter. That was, a, that, was a, uh, that was a parenthesis. But that allows me to come to what I see as the dilemma 
or impasse of the present. So I find my, for myself, I, I, I endorse critiques of authority and demands for democracy in all of the contemporary cycle of struggles, which I was just referred to somewhat earlier. But, but I'm not one who would claim that today's horizontal movements are sufficient and that the problem of leadership has been superseded. I wouldn't say that prefigurative experiences are sufficient, put it that way. Um, in some ways, I find that the, that the antibodies that were developed as a critique of leadership in the name of democracy within, within the movements has turned into a kind of autoimmune disorder. Um, but really, it's maybe better to say that there's, and this is what seems more important to me, is that there's, there's sometimes a confusion between the critique of leadership and lack of organization. Like that the, the, the refusal of leadership doesn't require, uh, in fact, requires more organization than less. And so it's that, that would be my, my first point about that side. But that's, and um, on the other side, I would not either say, and now you're just coming back to the alternative I posed at the very beginning. I would not either say that given the weakness or the lack of effectiveness or the lack of a long-lasting character, the temporary nature of the movements in this current cycle of struggles, I would not say that given those, or, the, or rather even their defeat by the forces of order, um, I wouldn't say that therefore one must return to and try to resuscitate the corpse of modern revolutionary leadership. Instead, I have, a, I, have a, I have a different proposition. Like, I, I'm sort of assuming, at least when I pose those two points in rather extreme terms, that they meet with a certain amount of uh, agreement on your part. But they might not, and that will be interesting in a minute. But, so let me go on what, what seems to me a method for moving beyond what I'm posing here as an impasse. And really all I have today is posing a method for it. I don't really have an answer. It, 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 first. I'll arrive in a minute at maybe a method, and first I wanted to pose a criterion for evaluation, for evaluating the contemporary political experiments, let's put it that way. So it, I, it's two things I want to actually address here. I, on one side, I mentioned the cycle of struggles that perhaps from 2011 to 2013, including in their various differences, and I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly conscious of all the uh, ways in which all of these are not similar to each other, but nonetheless, I would say fun function in a kind of cycle of struggles from Tunisia and Egypt through, through uh, Greece and Spain to the U.S., leaving it then 2013 to Gezi and the protests in Brazil. Um, I'm not sure if one should include Maiden in this in, 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 in Ukraine, if the umbrellas in Hong Kong should be part of it, and to what extent Black Lives Matter should be part of this. But in any case, that's the one hand I want to have a criterion for evaluating the movements in that, that uh, at least share certain uh, practices and, and aspirations that I'm putting together in Cycle of Struggles on that side. On the other hand, I would also like to be able to evaluate the um, leftist or progressive parties and governments um, that have risen on the backs of the movements. I would extend this in some ways from the experiments in Latin America over the last decade to include the ones that I'm focused on most now with Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain. So here's the first, here's the first criteria. I want to talk, give you one, one idea from Deleuze and one idea from Mario Tronchi. Uh, the Deleuze one's very short and maybe maybe doesn't take us very far. I, I was interested in, uh, many of you have probably seen this video <laughs> interview that Deleuze did uh, called an ABCD, like so we did ABC and the interviewer gives him, with each letter she gives him a, a word and he's supposed to talk about that word. So we get to G, uh, G and uh, the word she gives him is gauche, left. And his response, the response that I thought was useful for this, the criterion is he says, he says, uh, there is no such thing as a government of the left. 
you can get other good movement with it. Which you might think would be a first to like against progressive governments or parties, something like that. But then he goes on to say, or this was the, the criterion for evaluation I saw, which is there are governments, there's no gover there's no leftist government, but there are governments that make more or less room for the left. Like that's what we would call a progressive government. I think this is now translating here or something. Because you can evaluate that government. Uh, on the extent to which it fosters or hinders the kinds of social movements that brought it to power. Like that's what I would, that, this would be a, uh, at, at least a useful place of starting as a kind of criterion of evaluation. That one would say, I, it, I would say, this is not part of Deleuze's response in that interview, I would say, in addition to their effectiveness on a series of practical matters, you know, in addition to negotiating with the Troika, but in addition to uh, Korea's government distributing wealth or um, any number of other practical matters, that, that one should also uh, uh, evaluate these leftist governments and parties on the ways in which they foster or hinder the social movements and in precisely with all of these leftist governments and parties that, that, that brought them to power. It might also answer the question, because of course cities and Podemos, and I would say the Mas of Bolivia and the PK in Brazil and any number of the other examples I'm giving in a rather um, haphazard group, all claim to be not parties like traditional parties and not a government like a traditional government. So part of part of that criterion, what I think would be that one could address that is that they is uh, at least what Deleuze is suggesting here would seem useful to me, which is to shift the focus away from the state and the party to the movements themselves, and ask and evaluate the state and parties of the left on the extent to which they do with their foster movements. Okay, that's uh, maybe relatively simple and maybe doesn't get us so far. Something that gets us further, I think, or that I find more um, richer, more intriguing, is a proposition by Mario Tronti in a, in a book written in the 1960s in Italy. So he wrote this in, the book was published in 1966, and you know, it's early in the 1960s, and perhaps we're in a different moment and it would resonate differently. But what he's proposing here is a inversion of strategy and tactics. And it's primi primarily along the lines that I was, that's why I wanted to set this up earlier that way. That the revolutionary tradition, this is what Tronti is thinking when he says this too, the revolutionary tradition poses the party, or say leadership, that's better for us here, poses leadership as the author of strategy, and that the movements are authors of tactics. And that that's how it's kind of division. When, 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 when Tronti says what we need is an inversion of strategy and tactics, he means that now, leadership should be given the task of a tactical approach. In other words, leadership should be partial and temporary, and in that way subordinate. Instead, strategy should be the purview, should be the domain of <coughs> popular struggles, of mass movements, of the multitude, whatever you like to call it. Uh, so the strategy here being the general project a long-lasting vision. So this is not, I partly think this is a useful starting point because this is not a refusal of leadership. Um, and in that sense, it seems to me it gets beyond that framework, or at least the framework I've been understanding of the errors of the communards, and in some ways invents a different logic. So the first question should be, the first question should be, how can tactical leadership be created? Or how, how can leadership be created so it's limited to only tactics? I have proposed this, proposed this to many friends, you know, or in, 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 in contexts that were first, people's first response is like, that's a horrible idea. Because leadership will never allow itself to be limited to, to context. That, um, it, it, so in some ways you could say that it activates your immune system. Um, and that's a healthy response, I, I think. Uh, central, our central committees, in contrast to the commune arts, our central committees would never be so angelic. Um, tactical 
temporary leadership. Um, would be refused and that leadership uh, would become permanent. Like that, that seems to be an adequate and, and useful fear. But I think that the focus needs to be instead on the other side, on the other side of my equation, of Toronto's equation, if I think of it to him. Um, how can we construct and or recognize a multitude that is capable of strategy? That's the real question, it seems to me. Um, and it's at this point for me, that I arrive at really the exhaustion of a purely political method of investigation. I think that posing these questions in purely political terms, yeah, at this point runs up, 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 up against the wall. Like what would it mean politically for the people or the multitude to have the capacity to be able to understand the general interests and to maintain long-term vision and goals. I don't think it can be answered in political, political terms. It seems to me that, in fact, this might be a, um, this might be a point at which one should reflect around a conference about radical democracy. That it seems to me such a question probably shouldn't be posed in political terms. But rather in terms, or I would prefer to say, like the, the conventional way of saying it in terms of the critique of political economy, but, but you could say it in another register too. In fact, let me try to say it uh, along with Marx again, um, because I think Marx's own answer to something like this, or his mode of investigation, is, is really in terms of, it goes under the rubric of the accomplishments of the capitalist era. Like I'm thinking of these passages in Capital in the book. There are a few of them. I mean, I guess in the manifesto, you too have an example of this. But there are a few times in, 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 in Capital where he actually talks about what will come next, about revolution, about the, the mode of production of associated producers, something like that. For instance, there was one which is the penultimate chapter of volume one, you know, at the end of part eight, in the, in the part on primitive accumulation, there's a brief three-page chapter that gives you that gives you this logic. There's also a similar chapter in um, in part five of volume three on credit here, but in here it's about it's with the revolutionary character of credit moving beyond the capitalist uh, era. And what he calls the accomplishments of the capitalist era each time he brings this up are cooperation and the holding in common of the earth and the means of production. So, in fact, that what one should really go into here is to investigate this in terms of property. Because what, he, what, what is meant by this is the destruction of capitalist property, the destruction of capitalist private property. That this is part of the, the ways in which capitalism, I mean, he, uh, Marx spends plenty of energy, and he's mostly read in terms of his moral and political critiques of the injustices of capital. And, uh, but also present is the affirmation of the accomplishments of the capitalist era that are a foundation for what comes, for what comes next. And like I was saying, that those, those are the two, I would say the cooperation and the common are the two accomplishments of the capitalist era, which destroy capitalist private property to them. I would, and so we, I would, it, it seems to me as a field of investigation, this is not just at work that one should look, but also in the expanded realms of social production. In that way, probably beyond what Marx has in mind. How do people produce and organize autonomously social production? In other words, how is, how is social cooperation produced in order? And to what extent do we have access to and share in common the means of social production, the means of the reproduction of social life? I put it there. I think that both of these are, are fields that require both a process of recognition and of constitution, by which I mean uh, simply that there are many ways in which we already possess the capacities of the autonomous production of cooperation or of 
that we share in common, ways that we share in common, both social forms, the earth, its ecosystems, etc. But there are also many ways in which, so it's not just a matter of recognition, it's also a matter of constitution. That, that would be what would have to be pursued and organized or further. There you go. So this is the terrain, it seems to me, of the necessary basis for a multitude capable of strategy. Able to, uh, a, a multitude capable of strategy, why? So I'm saying that a, uh, a population of people, even if I don't like that too much, but it could help me, um, a people that is able or uh, that is able to recognize together the general interests and to act in a long-term and sustained way. That's what I mean by capable strategy. And I'm trying to pose these, uh, what Marx conceives as the accomplishments of the capitalist era, cooperation and the common, or the holding in common of the earth and the, mode, the, the means of production, that's his way of saying it, um, as bases for, bases for that ability. And it would precisely be that, let me come back to this then, it would precisely be that if uh, a multitude capable strategy that would rele effectively relegate a leadership to a tactical role. Like that's what I mean, it's not, um, it seems to me, I'm, I'm very happy uh, supporting Cerise and Bodenos, and even in various ways other uh, leftist governments in power. And it seems to me that criticizing them for not relinquishing power only has a limited utility. It seems to me that the real uh, the real task to be done is instead to develop this other side, like I said. To once once one can accomplish a multitude capable of strategy or a population or the masses able to act in a uh, in their own collective long-term interests in a consistent way, then the second side will come of its own accord in a way, that it will have the power to limit leadership to temporary and partial uses. That's really why I've, where I've come to an end. So the, the, the inversion of strategy and tactics in this way, um, insisting on democracy, not by refusing leadership, but by relegating it to a subordinate role, this seems to me a way to move beyond the framework designated by the errors of the communards, and maybe more importantly, to address what I see as the impasse faced uh, by the movements and the parties that claim today to represent them. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Hart, for that really interesting uh, talk about uh, the problem of leadership. We are going to open the round of questions. Um, so I'm going to be standing up to improve my vision. So does anybody have questions? You're starting there, following that, the man over there, then Yan, and the other side can raise. No, just, just pass it back. Just pass it back, yeah. Pass it back, yeah. It. And would you mind if I do three and then I talk? Because otherwise I feel like I am not talking too much. And I'll talk about that. Thank you very much for, for this talk. Um, I would like to um, a little bit push back uh, against this idea that we cannot um, address the issue of leadership or of inversion of leadership and, uh, uh, and the movement uh, the hierarchy, if you want to put it this way, in terms of uh, in, in, in political terms, I think that there is a um, like principle of political organization that actually can help that um, help think about that. It's it's been enacted in um, well, what I think, in, I mean, it's a principle of organizing. I don't know, like council democracies and so on and so forth. And I was uh, which the, the the principle of federalism, but not in terms of federal state, but the federal is all the way down, right? Um, and I was thinking, um, I was uh, wondering what do you think about that? Um, 
I think so. Let's do let's do another maybe even we'll have some time. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, agreeing with your prognosis, um, to be trite, can you outline just one or two mechanisms as to how you think what you suggested might be achieved? Well, the negative features... Or no, no uh, some positive mechanisms as to how you would go about, hopefully, um, because what you're suggesting is fairly abstract, so I'm wondering if you could make one or two concrete suggestions as to how one might okay. go towards achieving it. Hi, thanks for your comments. Um, while you were talking, I had, uh, I guess, two or three examples that popped up in my head that I'd want to know how you respond to, but I guess you um, <coughs> didn't address explicitly too much. Um, so, I guess in thinking about like leadership and revolution, one thing I was thinking of from past examples when we talked about like examples of common arts um, that I want to know how you engage with is the history of anti-colonial rebellions, so slave rebellions, um, indigenous battles, I guess, in North America is a commonly thought of place for that, but even like um, Indian colonial. Um, that's in the past, I guess, mostly. Um, and then now in terms of like alternate models of leadership and organization, um, I guess one hot example now for a lot of people is like the Kurdish liberation struggle of Rojava and so on. So um, especially in the whole thing about like you know rejecting the state as a form to use um, a form to attain. Um, but I don't know if necessarily we have their own structures they would um, and just yeah anything about like leadership and revolutionary organizing um, it's kind of surprising that uh, uh, like a something that would have a pretty clear <laughs> opinion on that, like uh, anarchism would only get like a parenthetical mention, so I just like want to know more about the critique of those. Okay, yeah. Um, with the first one I have, uh, is trying to I, I think I'll do them in order because I can't think of a way of combining them. Uh, the first one about properly political terms, I do think, as you're suggesting, one can define democracy in properly political terms. What I was suggesting, and probably didn't explain well enough or articulate well enough, is that it seems to me that um, in order to verify that possibility, the possibility of that, that that's what can't be done in, 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 in solely in political terms. In other words, if you would say, uh, if you would ask if people are capable of democracy, or what is it that allows us to assume that people who are capable of moving themselves collectively, that's what seems to me one has to look to their capacities in forms of social organization. And that's for me, like, uh, social production is one way of grasping what people were capable in everyday life. That's, that's, I guess, what I mean. Um, I, I would not, uh, I think it's important not to assume that humans have a natural, innate faculty to collective self-governance, mm -hmm. um, and that and that's a um, if one does assume that, then um, then it is a relatively large task to evaluate and both either recognize or construct what those conditions should be. Um, Yeah, I can think of another a number of textual references of people doing that and, and posing, like for instance, uh, in Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, he's thinking about freed slaves that he recognizes, or it is, it's, his, it's his estimation that they're not, because of their, what the, the way they've been trained, that they're not capable of democracy at that point. 
um, and, and trying to reflect on what would it take to create uh, a population of freed slaves that are able to collectively rule themselves. So anyways, it's that kind of reasoning that seems to me is required. And, and uh, at least in my own estimation, that has to go through a different, through a different logic. Well, you're certainly right, and I'm uh, with what you were saying, which is that you were giving brief accounts of ways of defining uh, ways of defining democratic formal arrangements of democracy in, in political terms, and that certainly seems there certainly seems right to me. Um, I was there was a morning session in which there was a debate about, or part of a discussion about Arendt and her conception of, uh, is there, there was political motion of configuration, I think I'll probably see the speakers around somewhere, which, and, and whether such discussions have to pass through the realm of necessity. And that's exactly what I'm saying here, is the realm of necessity here, I, I, I mean, that's what I meant, Arendt means too, is poverty, which you means, or, or the social, that's it. Configuration seems to me that's what a, these discussions, the, the question of democracy has to be asked. So maybe that's a simple way of saying. Concrete suggestions. Um, <coughs> no, I, I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm um, I think I'm opposed to someone in my position making concrete suggestions. And the reason is, um, the reason is that I think the kinds of innovation <coughs> happens collectively in movements. But what, what one can do, and this is, the, what, what one can do is um, both recognize what's happening in movements or what's, you know, and, and then also uh, pose criteria for evaluation. I mean, that's what I was. Um, I mean, one could form, you know, form a party, you know, more or less, but they almost starts out of the philosophy department at the of the grid, and then they form a party, but that's not me. Uh, <laughs> that would be... That would be a kind of suggestion, but yeah, I, get, I think that's right. I mean, I hope it's not. I hope it doesn't seem wrong to you that I would. I don't mean it as um, either a matter of modesty or something else. I, I, um, I think rather re recognizing the con concrete instances, and so that's in a way what the what you were asking about about some other, some other examples of concrete instances. And I know that with my you know uh, overly brief. Uh, characterization of 20th century revolutionary organizations. But I would pose uh, the 20th century anti colonial organizational forms in the same, in the same structure of uh, the same dialectic of leadership and, and, um, and popular insurrection. Um, I think that that's when one. I I think that that's, or that the the that the, the uh, anti-colonial struggles that it, that are occurring to me, you know, from from the Maoist movement, what in China and elsewhere, the, the North Africa, the anti-French, anti-colonial movements, the anti-Lan, Nigeria, etc. I think that these are geometrically of the same form of a. The dialectic with the center. Of it. What what it would be? I, I think this is a uh, part of what you asked, which I'm not, which I've not qualified. <coughs> I'm interested, but not don't know enough about. Would be the ways in which the struggles in different parts of Kurdistan do or do not coincide with the the form of the uh, social movements in recent years. Or um, right, or different, or different uh, representative structures. Uh, as someone was mentioning at an earlier panel, the uh, I, I too have read a number of things about comparing uh, the Turkish Turkish movement within Turkey. I mean, the Kurdish movement within Turkey with 
the Zapatistas and, and recognizing certain kinds of similarities, even though Ochalan is not nearly as poetic or um, <laughs> charismatic. But the um, but I don't know enough about either about the about the Kurdish movements in West Kurdistan or Turkey or, or the others. Say. Yeah, I'm sorry. About that. Uh, you, you also asked the anarchism question. Let me let, leave that aside for a second. Although you, what you were uh, challenging with is you said you left that aside. So, but I'll leave it aside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall we do a second? Yes, yeah, sure. Of course. Three questions. Okay, Professor Fraser has the first question. You can pass the mic. Thank you. It's a, it's a really um, interesting set of problems you're posing. And unlike uh, a previous questioner, I'm very uh, positively disposed to the idea that we shouldn't think about these questions in exclusively terms, but we should look um, at the uh, larger social historical conditions for the possibility of this kind of, um, um, we called it, um, strict, a multitude capable strategy. Um, however, now, if to, to do that really seriously, I think you are um, giving a one-sided, rosy view of what capitalism gives us. I would say that it does give us uh, these things, but in a, uh, let's say, an objectivating and antagonistic mode, that it does not give us the experience of cooperation, the experience of uh, jointly, um, you know, working in a common uh, holding the means of production in, in common. Objectively, there is a world market, there is an international division of labor, that we share a single biosphere, these are all objectively true things, and there are things that um, that we can even say, yes, capitalism created for us. Um, but at the same time, capitalism um, creates the, uh, a tremendous fra uh, fragmentation uh, of experience and of, um, you know, differentialization, uh, comps, uh, at least the appearance not, maybe not just the appearance of conflicting interests, competitive antagonistic relations. Um, and by the way, um, to me, this problem I'm raising is not, it's not specific to can the multitude do it, can anybody do it? I mean, this is our condition in general. Right. Um, so, I think the question is what kind of mediation is there between these objective possibilities and um, our capacity to, uh, or, or the, the mode of, of in which they are experienced uh, by people. And I would say that, um, that an, another old uh, dichotomy from the revolutionary tradition that seems to me quite relevant here, which I don't think maybe you mentioned, but I, I don't recall, is something like a spontaneity versus theory. I mean, I think you get the objective picture by, precisely by stepping back and thinking theoretically. And I don't, like Gramsci, I don't think officially designated intellectuals have a monopoly on that. There are intellectuals everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But um, this is, I don't know, these are terms which I think would be helpful to uh, think about. I think a spontaneously acting uh, multitude or spontaneously acting leaders or anybody is um, not going to develop that kind of orientation that we're talking about. Um, and um, only by somehow figuring out how to bracket all the ways in which our experience is partial and mutually antagonistic. Anyway, so just ask me to reflect more on that. Okay, the next question is a gentleman with the blue shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, building on, uh, is this working? Building on Nancy's uh, 
point. I mean, I like the direction in which you are questioning your own work uh, in this talk, but I would I would push you much further. I'm sure much further than um, than you want to go. I mean, I, I I would start with not by questioning the idea of a self-governing multitude, but by saying by by rejecting the idea. In other words, I think there are really there never has been a self-governing uh, multitude. We know that per se, in my view, uh, we know that uh, spontaneous actions of crowds when people lose their individuality and and, and act as as a group have done good things like kill the landlords and seize the palaces and, uh, and things. But these are, these are, uh, are really moments. Um, and we also know the dangers, uh, and may, probably many of us have experienced these dangers um, over time. And we also have the experience of great um, multitude formations uh, that have really been effective and worked, such as the great movements of the 1960s and the great movements of the 1930s in the United States and go to other countries and uh, so forth, such as the civil rights movement, uh, the, uh, the anti-war movement. Um, and these are movements uh, that have had leadership, organization, and strategy. And also, I don't think you can separate tactics and strategy. Tactics is simply a way of implementing a, a strategy. These are movements that have had analysis, maybe not enough of an uh, analysis, but they've, they've had them. I mean, they've been very organized. They have, to, they have people on, on the streets who organize how, to, how we're demonstrating and so forth. We don't just um, have uh, upsurge. So what then creates the organizational questions? I agree with Nancy totally about uh, the character of capitalism in our time, but what, what uh, creates the organizational questions that are unique to the present moment? Because these are mom uh, questions that run through the whole history um, of the left. And I would point to two things. I mean, the first thing is the change of character of capitalism in terms of its global character, what gave the left from the <laughs> gave the revolutionary tradition its, its, its character from the 18th century, basically through the 1960s. It was a state-building tradition. It had to seize power, it had to seize states, it had to take over states um, and, and uh, transform the conditions in, in uh, those states. And that's not just communism, but uh, all the developmental uh, revolutionary movements, quasi-revolutionary movements, uh, Mexico, uh, Egypt, and Nasser's Egypt, and so forth. Uh, and that's changed, because they changed character of capitalism in our time, uh, which I won't go into, but uh, it requires a completely different way of thinking about a revolution. It's, it, it, you know, you can't ignore the state, but it can't define itself in terms of the state. And the second thing I would point to that you put in a parenthesis, I think the role of the women's movement has been extremely important in this. When I think back to the 1960s, Yes, there was the critique of leadership in the new left. It was very important in the whole idea, as opposed to the 30s, that the left should be prefigured and so forth. But I think the women's movement brought it to a, to a different level. And we have, that's something I think that has to be thought through uh, very, uh, you know, raises really deep questions about the relationship between the, uh, uh, the women's movement and the revolutionary tradition uh, in terms of questions of organization and leadership today. Uh, we have a third question uh, right over there. I guess uh, it's a similar uh, question that Nancy proposed in version of the, uh, the strategy and tactic. And we know that the multitudes um, are extremely skillful in um, kind of developing this creative um, tactics. And they are they mobilize and they are actively encampments and, and uh, they um, but the, the problem is how um, do you would you imagine that the multitude can form a long term kind of coherent um, strategy which implies the durability and the stability of the multitude. Because when it comes to tactic obviously the multitude's changing forms, the tactic tactics quickly change. But when you talk about the, um, some form of strategy, then you are uh, talking about some form of dis 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 
which contradicts the idea of the market. Okay. <coughs> yeah, maybe I should move, move backwards, I, uh, because um, because I might have a different understanding of multitude, um, <laughs> which is not as an indifferent crowd. It's not as a mock. Um, and it's also not in a in a state of perpetual change. Um, I think we're just trying to think the possibility of democracy. I mean, that's what seems to be at stake in these questions: is whether democracy is possible. Um, by which I think I mean something as simple as collective self Um Yeah, and so maybe, and also multitude. I, I don't mean it also as a <coughs> It's a, just a name for what one sees of what happens in the street, but rather as a political project. Uh, or rather, it was one time, I mean, but the, maybe this is the problem of writing long books together or something. That I remember Tony and I reflecting on at one point saying, well, there's really two ways we're using multitude. There's like an always already multitude, which is like from time immemorial that have always been the multitudes acting, and then there's a not yet multitude, which is the way we're more likely which is, is a political project that is in yet form. Um, and that, I mean, I, I think, Hakan, what you're saying is exactly what I'm trying to work through, which is the, uh, because I, like you, am recognize the need for, not permanence, but a kind of continuity, a kind of continuity of <coughs> struggles, to put it, put it like that. Um, and, um, and I don't think, and I don't think that the traditional leadership forms are required. That's what I'm, uh, maybe that's what, maybe that's just a wager, you know, something like that. Uh, that I would refuse to accept the idea, let's put it like that, that, there, that there's no possibility of a self-governing population, but rather that we have to accept I mean, this is what I feel like uh, the movements after their defeats of recent years are constantly being told. You might not like centralized authority, but you need to hold your nose and accept it because that's the only choice you have. And that's, I'm not willing to accept that. Also, I don't think it's true, but maybe I should say, but maybe that's a better response. Um, but I don't think it's true. There's, there's some form of mediation, like Nancy said, seems to me, Right, it's not usually my language, but I think that there is that that is a way of uh, thinking about it. I'm not I'm not at all talking about spontaneity. Like so, if if if, if mediation is what what is not spontaneity, then I, that's certainly that's certainly what I'm thinking here. And and I and I definitely agree with you when you say that the the theory isn't the exclusive province of uh, intellectuals. Uh, in fact, I think. I think that one of the things that variety movements have done in recent years is great, great, I should say, generators of concepts, like that much more than, than um, the paid intellectuals. Um, and I guess I am, you know, so let me just do that now retreat. I, I've done this a little bit, uh, not, not exactly systematically, but to the very first thing that, uh, that, that Professor Fisher said, which was the that uh, you were uncomfortable with the overly rosy conception of the accomplishments of the capitalist era that I posed on. Yes. I'm posing it in a somewhat <laughs> compensatory fashion. Like, I recognize the ways of, that we are, uh, that we are uh, blocked, that we are crippled by work, by, uh, and by various forms of the capital. I mean, there are a lot, I mean, that, that's, that seems to be an easy, uh, I, I feel like that's what we're all taught, you know that. I mean, maybe I shouldn't assume that. But it, that I, I'm thinking in a kind of, that also, that while recognizing that, and this is why, I guess I feel like this is a part of Marx's own perspective that 
I feel is not insisted on by Marxists, uh, which is that he, it has to be ambivalent to him. The capitalist era has to be ambivalent. If it weren't ambivalent, ambivalent meaning two sided, you know, that at the same time that it's a, uh, that it's a mechanism of torture and disempowerment, it's also posing the conditions for uh, not only its own overthrow, it not only creates its own grave diggers, it also creates the subjects who will, who will, um, who will sustain an alternative mode of social life. It's that that I want, if it weren't for that, I mean, I, I also, uh, this isn't the substantial argument, but you know, if it weren't for that, what would we have? It'd be hopeless. Like we, there would be, uh, it, so, for instance, in, at least, in, like I'm thinking in Marx's work, I, I was just teaching that the section in volume three about credit, and and he's saying that uh, this was his. He just has a paragraph about how uh, credit and usury functions in Asia, and he says that that um, it also credit and usury destroy a mode of production. That's what they do. They destroy feudalism in Europe. That's what usury did. But it did. Uh, what what happens with the credit system in capitalist societies that not only destroys capitalist mode of production but it also creates the basis for um, communism or, there he says, the mode of production of associated producers, whatever. And so that's what, that's what I'm interested in, that dual nature of it, and in and investigating that. Like, what are the ways in which, in capitalist society, and it's not because of something innate to us, but also because of the modes in which we relate to each other now, that we're, that, 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 that we're, the bases that we can exploit for different purposes that are that are given to us. Anyway, that would require my investigating. Go ahead, say it. I, I think we, we completely agree about this two-sided quality. Uh -huh. uh, I'm just saying that you move, for me at least, mm -hmm. too quickly from one side of that yeah. to your thesis about right. strategy and multitude, um, whereas I think to take the other side seriously um, you have to have something to say about where people in really existing capitalist life um, get the capacity to think long term, to <coughs> think about the planet as a whole, mm -hmm. um, et, cetera, et cetera, when so much of life is organized exactly to make that impossible. Right. That, that's what went too fast. For right. No, no, you're right about the too fastness. You're right about the too fastness, and I also think it's somewhat, I'm thinking in a, uh, like I said, a sort of compensatory logic, which is, uh, I'm taking for granted a certain side of that, recognizing the ways that we're stunted by, by capitalist uh, society. And then wanting at least assistance is not that there is no face to that. I think those were the things I wrote down. Okay, we got another round uh, here first. Hey. Can you all hear? No. 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 Is that now? Oh, yeah, that's okay. good. Yeah. So, um, earlier today, this morning, uh, we had talked about uh, radical democracy in history, two different experiences in France, Russia. So, approaching radical democracy nowadays, uh, it seems to me that it's a notion of transformation, transformative, which we could be building every day according to the current moment. So I wanted to answer whether nowadays you think that this notion is closer to um, more participatory practice. And if do you think that it is possible or not necessary or post to which representative institutions or representative democracy? You have spoken several times in your talk about different cases in Europe, the Spanish one and in Spain. So um, Political parties or some new political parties are trying to introduce new ideas, new structures. Louder. Louder. Sorry, Please hold it very close. close tactics. Really yeah, close. tactics. Yeah. So, you have talked about leadership, tactics, strategies. So, 
also if you think that this radical democracy is possible within this new political <laughs> formations and platforms. Because that's what I was thinking myself as we were talking today and also from previous uh, presentations. Thank you. I There's a question in the back. Yeah. There. You. Thank you, Professor Hart. I wanted to, um, I guess this is somewhat on the same lines as some other people have mentioned, but when you said, for instance, uh, Dubois' uh, Bois, sorry, um, statement that slaves were not ready for democracy because of their experience of slavery, for me this strikes me as the exact argument that was used, for instance, to re-enslave uh, former slaves in the Antilles in under, under the pole. So maybe the response to that is, well, neither are the French ready for democracy either. Um, but I don't, I mean, my, my concern here is for exactly in this, pro, this duality between leadership and um, multitude or, or masses or whatever, um, the, the argument that one is not ready for democracy is, it seems to me, the exact argument that's used to deprive people of democracy. Um, so maybe, so I don't know how to, maybe this is just a slippery slope and one has to be attentive to it, but uh, I wonder what you could say about that. Oh, Andreas had a question. Um, yes. Yes, uh, uh, important questions that um, uh, I think we will also discuss them tomorrow in the round table. I want just to uh, uh, clarify one distinction. It seems to me that um, the difference between uh, leadership in uh, revolutionary politics and leadership in, uh, let's say, a stable democratic re regime was not drawn enough. Uh, and that was due <coughs> perhaps to the use you made of uh, Syriza. Yeah. Let's make it clear. Syriza is not a revolutionary party. It's a uh, uh, leftist uh, um, co uh, combination of uh, some social movements with some party structures. Uh, its main uh, um, goal is uh, to take uh, Greece or the Greek society out of austerities and uh, the neoliberal project, but it's not uh, to have a revolutionary transformation of society. <coughs> so, this reference to Syriza made me a bit confused uh, about what uh, leadership in what political circumstances, because it's different the need uh, in moments of uh, revolutionary democratic, revolutionary struggles, in moments of, uh, let's say, more normal democratic politics. Uh, but also uh, another reference to about Syriza, uh, if we shouldn't forget that uh, two years ago Syriza had only 4%. It didn't have even the support of social movements. It was not very, uh, in uh, its main uh, presence in social movements were not in uh, uh, with labor uh, um, uh, unions, it was mainly with the struggles uh, for uh, irregular migrants uh, and the uh, questions about migration, that was its main importance. Uh, and suddenly the, the, the crisis uh, uh, launched them to 25% uh, uh, to one year and a half ago and then uh, to government uh, in the last elections. But it was not because uh, of its presence, its organic presence in uh, social struggles uh, uh, with mass movements in Greece. Uh, its position is much more vulnerable today because it lacks this kind of uh, rudeness uh, with, uh, with movements. Although its position with irregular migrants is very strong, very committed, and that uh, I, I think generates another kind of questions uh, when one speaks about uh, Syriza. I mean, you're right about the, 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 the distinction. This is maybe another going too fast uh, okay. question about the, um, the distinction between revolution forms of organization and revolutionary movements and electoral parties. Yeah, I'll think, I mean, that's certainly true. Uh, let me think more about that. With the, you know, it's not an easy question when you ask about the, the where, I, where I cited the boys and the um, the, another example that comes to mind often for me, just maybe just because I go back to it often, is one in, uh, in Lenin's State and Revolution where he says that the Russian, the Russian people, you know, the Russian worker, as they are constituted today, have a boss at work and therefore they need a boss in the party. What we need to do is transform their human nature before that they were. I take him seriously, 
you know, I, I'm not, or at least I'm not one to, I mean, I, I don't think it's an, uh, it's a, it's saying, it's, it's a kind of pragmatist argument that one's uh, capacities are defined by experience, if you put something like that. Um, I think what it requires, though, is to not assume, uh, not assume, bless you, are not assume uh, democracy, by which I mean with the uh, collective self-government, as a innate or natural capacity, but rather something that has to be constructed. Uh, and that, uh, I, 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 you, you're absolutely right that that's, it resonates with all kinds of nefarious arguments like you're suggesting. But it doesn't seem to me an avoidable uh, argument to confront. Uh, but you're right to pose it as a uh, challenge about whether um, radical democracy in history, about whether more participatory struggles are possible today, rather than Past, I mean, if, if I understood you right, uh, I do think I, I um, you know I do think that the it, 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 I'm, I'm not sure if this is what you what you were intending, but uh, but I do think that the that the conditions the the, the capacities for revolutionary organizing are. Uh, like not only present today, that many of the obstacles of the past that, that uh, can be surmounted, something like that. But I don't mean to, by that to say that any of the current concrete examples we have are superior to the previous ones. Rather that, um, but also I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, this would be, but I'm not sure if this is what you were intending for this too. I, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to support any number of these, uh, both existing governments or, or parties that are running on left platforms without assuming that they are in themselves revolutionary. That seems to me, I, I have no, I think I'm not very, uh, I'm not very orthodox. Or you might say I'm a slut. I don't know. I would have something like that. But it doesn't. It does seem to be absolutely right to support them without with, uh, without uh, assuming without the, the burden of having to assume that they, they have revolutionary possibilities. I'm much more interested in the potential within social movements, even though they've been continually defeated. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if the distinction should be made between whether they failed or were defeated. Um, I'm much. I, uh, my, my instinct is to think how, how the movements have continually been defeated in recent years. Um, I mean, just because I, uh, okay, well, I didn't make that distinction make any sense. I was going on there. Okay, we got another round. We still have time, so we'll take one worry. Yeah. Uh, there was a question right there. If you can pass the mic, and also please speak to the mic. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the, uh, for, the, for the talk. I'd asked a question. It's somehow not going into the mic. Just, yes. Hello? Yeah, yeah, that's better. That okay. Way, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd asked a question in an earlier uh, conference about uh, redef redefining uh, dissent within, uh, let's say, anti neoliberal governments and, and, and uh, movements. That, uh, that, 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 you asked that to me? No, no, I didn't ask in the oh. previous conversation. You pretty much <laughs> answered it almost directly with your whole talk, so thank you for that. But I, ha I, I, I had a question around some more specificity on that, if it's even possible if you thought of that, or what, uh, 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 you know, framed around the question of at what point should the left, or left, people with a left inclination of beliefs or, 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 or whatever, uh, begin to oppose a revolutionary government or a, or a, or a, or a leadership of, a, of the left? And are there any examples, just for illustration, or aspects of examples that um, would be today. For example, would Mugabe belong to that category? Would, would Abel Morales belong to that category? Would Barack Obama belong to that category? Why or why are we? Uh, the other question is right here. Here, 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 in the front. Thank you. <laughs> We've got one in the back that's under hand up for a while. Yeah, I know. These guys were first. Sorry. <laughs> 
so much for leadership. That's the problem about leadership. No, no, I like the I'm the third edition of leadership here. Like yeah. Thanks a lot for your, for, for your talk. I'm here, Mark. Um, I, I can see how um, your redescription of the roles of the, uh, the multitude versus the leadership as tactics versus strategy can make sense, especially as a way to uh, re look at how the successful uh, movements, such as the, the Vietnam War protests, some aspects of the civil rights movement, some aspects of the women's movement, because they have very clear goals. So if you want to think of strategy versus tactics as means, or goals versus ends, as a means, where there's a relatively clear, clear goal or set of goals, the multitude can sort of sustain that, and the leadership is thinking of different tactics to achieve that. But then um, the reference to revolution reminded me of the uneasiness I had, which is at the very beginning of the talk, you bracketed the military angle. Yeah. And most people think of the military side of an armed struggle or a revolutionary um, movement as requiring because of the nature of military um, action, leadership at the top. And then, so to the extent that we're talking about a situation where you need to have the military or the armed struggle component, is it difficult to have the strategy on top and tactics on, on multitude, but flip it for the global side? Just curious. Thanks. Oh, and now the question in the bag. Thanks, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for this work on leadership. I, I would like to maybe go back to the third critique that Marx uh, did uh, address the common narrative, of, of, that is the fact that they left the gold reserve of the French, of Bank of France untouched, that here, and actually they, they use it as a guarantee to ask other banks to support the, the Commune in Paris. Anyway, this uh, gold reserve was left in the outskirts of Paris and felt in the hands of the enemy and was used to found the siege and that had a kind of role also in the, in the final collapse of the commune. I wonder if there is a different role of the leadership or a different critique of the leadership in the age of the golden standard that actually was still respected by the commune of Paris and in the age of uh, pure financialization like happens today because Potemus and Syriza somehow are responding to a kind of uh, debt crisis or financial crisis of Europe. So I don't know how much we should question the way they respond to movement, and how much they respond to the Central Bank of Europe in that. That's, like, that's very clever, I'm not sure I get it. But, well, let me start with the others, and then come back with Matteo, which, uh, with, which is, um, well, like, first, at, at, what, uh, at what point should the, should the movements oppose governments who have to claim to speak in their name? That's the way I would rephrase the, the first one. Um, was that? OK. Oh, that was back there. I was just thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't see any reason not to do that continually. Um, and certainly, as you said, I mean, you could add to your list with uh, Juma and the uh, Workers' Party in Brazil, and the, the, especially with the struggles last year. Um, what do you call it? Summer of 2013, October 2013. These were uh, and continuous ones against the Morales, Pedro Morales government. Uh, um, yeah, I don't see any. I don't see any reason. I don't need to see any reason for 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 for. Let's see. There's no. There's no requirement for faithfulness to those who claim to speak in your name. Like that, I, I would think that a continuous antagonism would be the best. Uh, uh, the best policy of that, I don't know. But with, with, the, um, with the goals, like, but, but before coming to the military question, um, I wouldn't see, like, I don't see strategy, or I didn't intend, I don't intend for strategy and tactic to translate into the question of demands and goals. Like, I think that continuity is possible without the uh, reduction of a movement to a series of goals. That's, but anyway, that wasn't that wasn't your that wasn't your point. Um, I do recognize with the way militarization has required hierarchy, um, and that's a constant danger 
I mean, the way that Zapatismo has managed, the way that DZLN has managed the kind of uneasy, uh, what do you call it, uh, coincidence between uh, clandestine military structure and uh, democracy in the communities is a really, it seems to me a remarkable, uh, I guess you call it achievement. Right, uh, something like that. And, and whether that's similarly true in, in the Kurdish movement and whether democratic autonomy and a, and a constant militarization is a similar sort of question, I, I wonder too. But I, I recognize the diff part of the difficulty of, uh, of the use of force, at least in its traditional forms, is that pressure. So, Matteo, I was trying to figure out how, I mean, how, when the shift from goal to financialization implies that you have to say, can you give me one more sentence? Right? No, it's just the idea that probably today a critique of leadership or any analysis of leadership, especially yeah. in the case of Europe and Syriza and form of political organization, they maybe have to address that capital has become much more abstract, you know, beyond the golden standard. Oh, okay. And today, Syriza and Podemos are no longer probably within the kind of post-colonial narrative, but, you know, fighting a proper, even more financialized form of uh, capitalist command, in that sense. So right. they just don't respond to movement in traditional sense, but probably to the desperation of the financialization of European society. Just there. Just mm -hmm. new form of leadership. In but is the way you're saying it, then, uh, a notion of Occupy and surrounding the European Central Bank is a little too concrete? Because no, no, that, that, that could be an example. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. That could be, yeah. So, so I forgot to mention that, yeah, indeed. <laughs> it's part of the, aside from Podemos and Syriza, we have also, yeah, the block by experiment. Right, but I was thinking, according to your logic, it could be that, that since financial capital isn't really located in that way, it might be a, a kind of relic to imagine that the central bank itself yeah. has the same kind of uh, uh, emplacement or yeah, location. All right, I'll think about that. that that's what I think. Okay, next question is here. If you can pass the mic. Um, also, we are live streaming the conference, so it is good for us if you can speak to the mic because then the people on the other side of the screen can hear your question. Um, all right, thank you. Um, I'm interested in, in the pulse of the social movement. Um, yeah, the pause, the like, the possibility to exist, and okay. what conditions of, of possibilities are created in terms of opening up that space you were talking about of those left leftist governments for those social movements, right? Yeah. So, I um, I worked for Correa in Ecuador, mm -hmm. and the way that I came about to work for him was because um, more well ten years ago. A few students of his, um, without him, we created what we called ourselves a social movement. It's called Ruptura. There was 25 because it was 25 years of democracy and we were 25 years old. So um, we ended up calling ourselves a social movement and we considered that to ourselves. And in fact, one, our first principle is radical democracy. So um, we ended up joining him in government we're very close to Juan Carlos Monedero. We've been in conversation with, with, with Podemos before they were Podemos. In, in a way, very much related to those that we align ourselves to in Latin America and in Spain, especially. Um, so we went into government with him. And our possibility to exist as a social movement was very much constrained by the uh, perverse uh, link between so between policy, public policy, and theory, and theoretical principles and politics. So once we were governing, we had our souls, or or we were invaded by bacteria, if you would say, <laughs> according to your analogy. <laughs> um, so we uh, basically uh, decided to take the hardcore antibiotics, and we ended up our relationship with Correa. Mm -hmm. 
So it was a, a, a massive uh, thing that we did. It was like 80 of us in very high positions. Um, and then we sort of died because we had to register as a formal political party. So this, this, is, the, this is the irony of being a social movement and out of proclaiming ourselves as a social movement and then having to register as a political party because our goal was governing. We wanted to be in power uh, with those same principles that put us to call ourselves a social movement. So you see that in, in practice, there's, there's a, there's a love-hate relationship with social movements and political parties as we <laughs> label those, ourselves like that. Anyway, so we die, basically, my colleagues would hate me to say this, but we are, let's say, in coma. Because we had to, uh, Correa was so clever that he changed the, the legal arrangements for p new political parties and existing political parties. So he is called the social movement because he encompasses a few movements uh, and we would have to talk about is the indigenous movement really represented there? Although he would include part of that. So there's, there's, a, there's a few things there. Anyway, so he changes the rules of the game and we have to register as a political party getting more than 500,000 signatures. So the organization and the structure that we had to take in the whole country before even going to elections to organize, so talk about leadership there, we worked our asses off to get not only the signatures to be able to register, but then have to defend those signatures in a crazy moment. Um, to because Correa said that they that we would have to like make sure that each signature was validated with the register the civil registration. So all all of these like mo moments that we would try to be a political party that we basically basically boycotted. Then we finally made it, and we went into elections, and of course we were crushed because we didn't have the money because. It, again, allocating money to political parties or social movements, which is formally, actually there's a few things that legalizing those two differences are basically how much money you get from the government for campaign. So in a way, we are formally a social movement, we acted as a political party, and we were killed by the fact that we were both. So I just wanted to give you that example to talk about that actual real conditions of possibility to become social, to, to enhance that principle as a social movement into a political party, and how power can really navigate through all these structures and, and actually become a two more. Uh, next question is for there. Thank you, thanks for your talk. Um, one of the things you said that the uh, strategically organized multitude would, would sort of um, compass is an insight into a well-understood general interest of some kind, or a collective interest. And that sort of struck me as a, as a I would say, yeah, a type of terminology that's maybe too, a little too close down, or that opens the door to a certain question of what type of knowledge uh, does the, evolves in a revolutionary situation, or what type of knowledge does the multitude have of its own interest. So uh, I always see the danger very acutely of sort of technocratic impositions, especially today, where you know like governance, both capitalist and anti-capitalist, talks about, has a lot to do with expertise. You know what type of technical issues can be solved, what type of uh, you know um, technologies we can mobilize, etc. And I feel the notion of, of interest, or sort of like an insight, you said an insight into the general in interest, and this is uh, maybe you know too close both in this respect. But also with respect to sort of a tradition of sort of theological sovereignty, you know, where the, you have the old trouble, where you, again, you know, also at this context, you have said uh, the people. This was interesting that you juxtapose interest and people in the same uh, sentence, also, which I think is quite important, perhaps. That we fall back into the sort of like old sovereignty that we're trying to escape from in the first place. And I feel, you know, maybe you can say a few words about the sort of like reconfiguration of the conditions of knowledge that would have to, you know come about also if we want to have this strategy of the multitude? What type of risks you have in terms of hierarchies between different forms of knowledge once you start talking about strategy in the terms that you laid out? 
Okay, the other question is in the back, all the way there. Um, first, thank you for your talk. I think that it's a poignant discussion to be had at the time. Um, <laughs> five foot two doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I think it's a really important discussion to be had, um, especially within these circles. There's been a discussion, I guess, of the self-governing multitude within a capitalist society and how strategies for resistance need to meet those requirements. I want to push you on something that you said, you mentioned briefly feminist movements, and I think that theoretically, being theoretically minded here for the large majority of the crowd, I suspect, um, that we are also confined within a patriarchal conception of leadership. And I want to push that because I think that perhaps feminist conceptions of leadership um, as multifarious as they are, hold a door or hold a key to unlocking a door that perhaps would help you conceive of a self-governing multitude that doesn't have a patriarchal conception of leadership. Uh, that's three, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'll start with Sarah. But it's just because, um, but this, so this, the, way you said, the way you said it, it was that, uh, Okay, let me try translating and see if that see if I'm if if I'm thinking on the same lines. Were, were you suggesting in some ways that maybe in the critiques of leadership I'm talking about, it would just be critiques of patriarchal leadership, but there would be other forms of leadership, non-patriarchal leadership, which would be susceptible to the same. I'm skeptical. Um, but 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 I'm but I'm open. But so what I'm the the kind of things, the kind of things I was thinking of, and this is probably another part where I went too fast. Um, we're both, you know, I was thinking of the historical text from like New York Radical Women or the Gainesville Collective, uh, and the, the and I'm thinking of the early 1970s here, you know, 69 to 72, three <coughs> like that. And the, both the practices, you know, the, the hope for consciousness raising as a um, as a practice, and the democratizing character of everyone speaking, but also the practices against leadership. And so those uh, classic texts of Joe Reed, uh, Joe Freeman, both the one that's often talked about or has been in recent years, the tyranny of structurelessness, but also trashing. Like so that the, which is recounts the brutal uh, forms of punishment of women who essentially disobeyed the rules and spoke to the media without permission of the group, and so were they, and were hence were hence cast in the media as the like this. It seems to me that those that what they were struggling with at the time, and in ways that were. <coughs> I don't know, saying something, anytime you use the term messy in politics, you know you're in trouble. But uh, I was going to say messy. I mean, they were they not all good. But it seems to me what they were struggling with was, OK, OK, so maybe it could be what you're saying. You know, it could be phrased in the way you were saying, which was, you know, so part of what the dictates against leadership there were, were from the experience of the women, many of whom directly taking it from civil rights struggles, uh, were dissatisfied with the way that men, but also from the student movement, were dissatisfied with the way that men took over. And so that the, the, um, the women who were in leadership positions were often in the language of these texts criticized as male identified. But the leadership itself, and a, a claiming to represent others itself, was at least in that context thought of as uh, I guess with your terms as a patriarchal logic. So anyway, all I mean, uh, uh, this is I'm a little fumbling a little bit, but I'm not seeing what, like are you thinking, now I'm thinking about your own work, are you thinking that women in leadership <coughs> positions in either social movements or, or military organizations have a different quality <laughs> that are, that, that, are, that, are, that uh, get outside of the, the kinds of, hierarchies and anti-democratic character that leadership has uh, traditionally. It seems like you're suggesting I, that. I, I wouldn't go so far 
hard to say that that's necessarily the case. I think it's worth a try given the like historical track record of patriarchy thus far. That being said, I think that feminists have a very unique um, history of strategizing across horizontal latitudes um, that specifically patriarchal social movements do not have that similar history of. And I want to press the a proliferation of examples, not just uniquely Western examples, um, and not just ones that uh, re return to my own work, but a diverse number of strategies that happen every single day. They run institution, they run institutions, they run homes, they give shelter. These are women strategizing together. They are multitudes, they are self-governing, despite capitalism, despite patriarchy. And I don't think that we give enough credence in our conceptions of leadership to that form of leadership that's very um, not unique to just women, but it's a feminist movement. And I think men can be feminists. Uh, people who don't identify with the gender binary can be feminists in that way. I think it's a, a specific form of feminist solidarity that's against hierarchical um, but you want conceptions to call leadership of leadership. Anyway. I think there's such thing as non-hierarchical leadership. I think that to deny it outright is perhaps a fault of ours conceptually. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'd have to think, I'd have to think more about it. Um, right, and the examples that come to mind for me are, are U.S. examples. Like, I don't know if you've read, a, there's another U.S. example that seemed, that was really great, I thought, a book by Erica Edwards called Charisma, I guess what it's called, shows she was, it's about, but this is her, the theme of the book is really how the, um, the violence of charismatic leadership within uh, the civil rights and black power movements. And so she has sort of different categories of violence. But, but, but leadership itself for her in that. And so she too was saying how uh, the organization of the accomplishments of the civil rights and black power movements were uh, widespread and largely female whereas the charismatic male figures were the ones who had the media attention. But she's not calling those leadership. That's what I'm, that's where I'm, so anyway, I'm, that's where I need to work through what you're saying and figure out how much of it's a terminological distinction and how much of it is, is really something quite different. You know, the question about what kinds of knowledge is and the question of expertise does seem to me really important. I, but one thing, and so, and hence, I do think establishing like in a variety of different ways, the, the, the ways in which uh, a, a kind of myth of expertise requirement is a is a uh, is a kind of blackmail and an obstacle. I, I, I agree with you, and I think. I, but the the place that I the only place that I ran into an obstacle with you, which which is at least what I understood, is it sounded like what you're saying is that once I started talking about interests, that's when it it has to collapse into a notion about expertise and such. And so that's what I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, that's why I was trying to, I do remember at some other times I have been reluctant to use the language of interest. I was trying to remember why, but I, um, but anyway, that, um, I do, but I, the general point is I do agree with you that the, that the question of the production of knowledge and the different forums or areas in which knowledge is produced partly has to be, it's not so much has to be shifted, or sometimes just recognized. Like just for instance in the, in the context of social movements in the academy to recognize that there's no kind of uh, theory and practice to buy. There's theory that goes on in the academy, some of it is good. There's theory that goes on in the movements, some of it is better. And so it's, it's a, like a theory-theory divide other than a theory practice. Part. Anyway, that's all going along with, I think, what you were saying. How to think about the interest part of that. And to say about the Korea government, I, I don't know. I, I've, in my very brief experience, I've recognized something similar, and that's an interesting, yeah, it's just a, a interesting and maybe tragic account of the, um, <coughs> But I think that, in my experience, the, the, the Korea government has its, a very specific way of disempowering social movements and creating a, a kind of 
but okay, the term that was given to me was a, uh, a project of a decorporativization of the state. Meaning, like on the one hand, you know, getting rid of uh, the guild of bankers, but also really uh, the indigenous movement, uh, feminist movements, all movements should have a direct relationship to the state. There's something terrifying about that. Rather than, uh, rather than uh, allowing the uh, construction of social movements in our autonomy for the state. That's what, anyway, I, I'd be interested to hear more about it. Um, okay, we have time for one last round of questions. So, uh, yeah, just we get a read. Yeah. Could I just add a footnote to the uh, point uh, about feminism, which is you know this is very complicated, uh, but uh, just uh, just a footnote. The the kind of classic um, critique, theory, whatever, of uh, you know, problems of leadership, at least one of the classic uh, critiques, is Freudian. The, the, the Freudian. Freudian. Freud, Sigmund Freud. Freud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, the, band, the band of brothers rebels no, against the father, they kill the father, and then they create a, a new father, and, and so forth. So there's a sort of, you know, there, there have been a huge number of discussions of, uh, you know, the revolutions, Robespierre, from Robespierre, and then, Communists and so forth that are along this way. And that is a that is a discussion of the that is pointing to the patriarchal character of uh, that kind of revolutionary tradition. The, the, the sons rebel against, kill the father, etc. And Juliet Mitchell, who you probably know, is a leading uh, feminist uh, from the 1960s, went on to become a psychoanalyst, and her recent work is on um, looking at the importance of sibling relationships uh, as opposed to uh, father-son relationships in psychoanalysis. Doesn't deny the importance of father-son, but she's talking about sibling. So that's just kind of a footnote to uh, your comment, or the comment that came from about feminism. It's just something to think about. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes. A mic? Is there a mic? Can I be heard? Is this okay? Yes. Okay. So, I suppose I would just like you to expand on what I take to be one of the kind of key terms or key concepts of your account, which nonetheless seems a little bit underdeveloped in at least what you told us right now, which is the notion of cooperation. Um, and it's obviously going to be key if we only understand how democracy and strategy can work if it's done through the kind of cooperative framework that capitalism has given us, imposed on us. Um, so I think when Marx, for example, wrote about cooperation, he had in mind obviously a very different kind of capitalist industry than we have today. Um, and I think one of the main differences today is that it's much more diversified. So on the one hand, we see in the West maybe this generalized trend towards so-called cognitive capitalism and material labor, affective labor. On the other hand, in other parts of the world, there's wildly different kinds of cooperation, um, wildly different knowledges that are produced, such as the kinds of um, factory or sweatshop labor. Um, and I I think at least what's come out in your account is maybe a tendency to kind of make this mode of cooperation or make our understanding of production much more homogeneous than it actually is today. So what I'm interested in understanding is just how we can kind of conceptualize how per, like heterogeneous elements of production and social reproduction um, can complement one another as opposed to basically being wildly antagonistic, which they are, I think, today. For example, a lot of people doing some kind of cognitive capitalist work today depend on kind of exploitation in parts of the so-called third world, for example. Um, so, re so related to this question of how we can understand a multitude as wildly diversified is also just, what's your basic class analysis that's underpinning 
how we conceive of cooperation, how we conceive of multitude, such that we're not still looking at kind of different antagonistic classes, which are nonetheless supposed to be the kind of agent or subject of emancipation at the same time, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I thank you so much for the talk. Okay. I, I wanted to expand a little bit on the great insight that was given about leadership and kind of its association with patriarchy from um, a lens that I've that I kind of have some experience with in the actual field of leadership studies. And <laughs> but you mean the business literature on leadership? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. The, uh, more in the social sciences. sciences. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and there seems to be kind of a a, a correlation between the kind of leadership that we've been discussing now and the, the great man theory of leadership as authority right. that, that dictates you know, as like a sovereign body, um, as opposed to an idea of leadership as a process that is relational and constantly creating forms of meaning and then mobilizing action. So maybe if I give some, some, some thoughts about that. No, say a little bit more, just because I didn't quite well, I mean, so I think traditionally leadership can be often understood as, as this sovereign body that's, that's in a position of formal authority yeah. that gives certain commands and has followers, and there's that kind of relationship to it. Um, but, you know, I, I've investigated some theories of leadership where it doesn't kind of have that relationship, but instead it's, it's actually, like, leadership itself is a process. And, and as part of that process, authority is actually negotiated, oftentimes switching roles, um, but ultimately just creating different forms of meaning and then mobilizing action in, in that kind of relational way. Uh, there is another question in the back, one last question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I would like to uh, return to uh, Tonti, uh, if I may. Um, you mentioned his uh, Inversion, reversion between uh, tactics and strategy. Now, of course, he, he also proposes uh, the inversion of, of, of class struggle, and, and, and like, let's say, to revert the, whole, the way we, we tend to uh, understand class struggle. Uh, Chonti proposes that we should approach it from the working class perspective uh, as actually as something that is initiated by the working class um, Whereas in the Marxist tradition, he says, very often the working class is conceived as, a, as, a, as let's say, the, the passive side of, of class struggle. Um, and this, this idea seems to be very prominent also in your work, in the Empire Trilogy, where, of course, the empires is very much um, uh, depicted as uh, well, a parasit parasite, basically, as, as, as the, the less uh, pretentious, less uh, initiative, uh, side of, of class struggle, and it, it struck me now when you when you when you made your point about the um, um, a strategy for multitude that you really well propose this as 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 a making use of the potentials that capitalism uh, offers rather than the other way around. So my question would be, how how is this ontological reversion reversion of class struggle? What remains of that in, 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 in the proposition you make now? I think I get that. <laughs> um, let me start with the leadership one. I, I, it's, um, leadership studies, like in the plurals, is a weird set of fields. Um, and I don't know if I've also sort of felt like in there's been a kind of chiasmic movement in the, as social movements have, have more and more refused leadership in the last two decades, there are all kinds of other social institutions that are highlighting leadership more and more, like universities or things. I, I was chair of a department for four years. I got an email every week thanking me for my leadership. And even like there's an elementary school on the on the street where I live, they've changed the sign now. It's an institute for the training of young leaders. Like elementary school, there's no more education. There's leadership training. That's all there is now. It's like, um, but anyway, it's a weird. That's a, that's 
there's a lot of weird things about it. And you're right that I, I think that uh, I've been particularly interested in the business literature about it because they have a whole slew of things about leadership. And I think there's something interesting to recuperate from it. I'm not, and it's you, as you're, you're actually right too that it's not just the um, what should we call it, big man authority. There, there's an overlap as well between business literature and social science. Yeah. And, and that's really interesting too because a lot of times they use different language but they're, they're talking about similar things. Yeah. Sometimes even drawing from radical concepts but tightly within the business world. Right. That's, I, um, I don't know, I don't think I have anything interesting to say about the connections, but it's an, it's a, it is, there should be a lot to say about it eventually. Uh, with, um, like there are two things, yeah, so it's, it's true, as you said, that, um, it's true that, that, that I think it is for, for, for me and Tony Negri, to been a, it has been a kind of, um, what you call it, uh, axiom, you know, theoretical axiom to, uh, and I wonder how much sometimes in a compensatory way, or even for Trump too, is in a compensatory way, is to recognize that the struggles of the working class come first. Yeah, so Tronti's formulation was that the struggles of the working class precede and prefigure the developments of capital. Uh, meaning that, yeah, there's a real in a moment of innovation. And I, had, and Tony and I translated that into uh, something that Deleuze says about Foucault, and maybe Foucault says it at some point too, but in Deleuze's book about Foucault, he says that, that everyone understands resistance all wrong, as if it was somehow responding to power. He says, no, instead, resistance is prior to power. Like, ontologically prior is what it means. Like, it's the moment of innovation. Re resistance is the moment. And so you're asking, how can that go together with this notion, this notion that I'm just, I'm now I'm just, uh, you know, directly taking these repeated passages in Marx where he says that uh, essentially that communism has to be born on the accomplishments of the capitalist era. It could be, oh, so here's, here's probably what that means, is that the accomplishments of the capitalist era are the accomplishments of the proletariat. Like that that's not, it's not that the proletariat is somehow separable from the capitalist era. Uh, so when one says cooperation, you know, like, so in that, okay, then I could come a little bit to the chapter on cooperation in, in the chapter 13, volume one, where you're right that there, that it is, of course, different and one has to rewrite that to think about cooperation in the present. There, there's two things when you ask. Like one is I was thinking about how in that chapter in Marx, um, the chapter on cooperation, there's, there's two pages about how the necessary role of the capitalist, you know, like uh, in production, because the capitalist brings the workers together, not only gives them the means to cooperate, but actually forces them for discipline to cooperate, like the general on the battlefield or like the conductor of an orchestra. Those are the two examples, the metaphors he gave. Um, this might be the uh, cooperation as an accomplishment of the capitalist era, might have to be thought of as the way that the, that the uh, kind of uh, <coughs> autonomous production of cooperation results from such things. But then you were asking me a more challenging question about it, what, what kind of global class analysis would allow one to talk about a, um, um, well, I really think that this, this uh, extended range of social cooperation, that's what, I mean, the way you were posing it, it was given the diversity and heterogeneous and even mutually conflicting elements, of global labor today, if one can put such a diverse things under that, that phrase, global labor today. How can one think about that um, together? As you're pointing out, but this is of course nothing new, that there are uh, elements or segments of the working class that depend on the exploitation of other segments of the working class, which, uh, which is always, which is always <coughs> the case. Um, yeah, I don't think that my, I mean, the, 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 the kind of class analysis that I would do wouldn't answer those questions. Like, wouldn't, what's your, wouldn't, 
wouldn't resolve those problems. I think the resolution of those problems has to be done. I mean, the, what, what problems do I mean? I mean, the problems like you're pointing out between a uh, an industrial working class in subordinated parts of the world, a intellectual working class in some dominant parts of the world, etc. These sorts of that doesn't seem to me. Those seem to me like real political challenges that have to be confronted politically, and and couldn't be done theoretically. You know, I'm kind of hot too, and so I think maybe we should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can see the. Uh, Thanks very much for coming and be so generous and sympathetic. <laughs>